Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I spent, um, oh, months at the uh, Truman Library about five or six years ago. I think the last time I stayed in Kansas City was in 2000 uh, for the uh, uh, Carnahan Ashcroft election, one of the uh, <laughs> strangest events in the history of American politics. Um, uh, glad to be back here again. I know that this is uh, talking about um, Truman and Israel is like talking about uh, the last time that the uh, Kansas City Royals won the World Series. Uh, and I, I have to warn you that um, I, I may disappoint you because I'm going to go around this in a kind of circuitous way. We'll get to Truman at the end, but uh, we're going to start uh, much further back, about 70 years before. Let me, let me say first about something about how I uh, came to write this book, because uh, I kept having to ask myself as I was doing it why I was writing it. Um, I, I, um, I wanted to write a book about the, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. I, I was concerned that I hadn't been a reporter and done the daily work, but I also worried that in writing about that conflict and about how about the conflict in the present, I would get into a kind of he said, she said dynamic that you sometimes find in divorce hearings, where you get into a question of who fired, whether the rocket was fired before the assassination, who really started the second intifada, who screwed up Camp David? In other words, where there, where there really is no resolution and the argument just goes back and forth. And I thought the way around that was to look at the history, and in particular to look at the Truman years, because that's really the beginning. That's when America became uh, in, involved in the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. And I thought that I could see from there uh, how it came to be that the conflict itself had lasted 50, 60 years, uh, not been resolved, and the United States had not been very effective in trying to reconcile the two parties. Perhaps I thought in looking at the Truman years I could find that. So that's how I started, and I started with a pretty blank slate of what, what happened there. The only thing was that as I proceeded, what I found was that in those years, and we're talking about 1945 to 1948, those are the years when people learned about the Holocaust. Those are the years when people learned that the Nazis had killed six million Jews. And that fact alone, deservedly so, overshadowed everything. And it made it very hard for the people at that time, and it's made it very hard for historians ever since, to understand both sides of the conflict, and particularly the Arab side of the conflict, and why they were so angry uh, in that period. So what I thought of doing, and what I was driven to do, was going backwards, and to try to provide a setting for the Truman, for, for, for a setting in which Truman, in which Truman himself <coughs> found himself in 1945 when he took office. So I want to say a little uh, to begin with about that, what the setting was, what, how this conflict began. To do that, you really have to go back to the uh, 1880s. And, uh, Zionism starts in the Pale of Settlement, which is the area on the edge of the Russian Empire where Jews were allowed to live and where the greatest concentration of Jews was in Europe. Jews were treated as an alien nation, and Zionism really arose as a movement with the idea that insofar as Jews were an alien nation, they would be better off having a real nation, a real nation to which they could go, to which they could find refuge so that they could no longer be lodged within these various countries as aliens. That was really the, the heart of the idea, original idea of Zionism. It was a kind, an idea of national liberation in that sense. But it was, a sense, it was an idea of national liberation for a people that didn't yet have a nation. That's the, that's the positive, that's the side of Zionism. The problem was that the country that the Zionist movement, which begins in the 1880s, emigration starts in the 1890s, 
The country that the Zionists chose to emigrate to was one where somebody else already lived. In Palestine in 1890, all these demographic things are in dispute, but I'll give you just, a, I think, what a, a, a rough estimate that, that a lot of the demographers would agree with. There were about 500,000 people in Palestine. It was an agricultural area. About uh, Jewish population is about 4% or 5% at most, about 10% Arab Christian, the rest Arab Muslim. The Arabs had lived there since uh, 600, the year, the year 600, so for, for 1,300 years. Uh, the three peoples got along reasonably well. But what happened was that when Zionists began emigrating, not with the idea of, like, let's say, the Irish coming to Boston, but with the idea of not just settling there, but of establishing a Jewish state, that created the, the basis for a conflict. In 1917, the British decide that they're going to sponsor or champion a Jewish homeland in Palestine. At the same time, you get Woodrow Wilson and also Lenin, the Russians, pressing this idea of self-determination for colonized people. The Arabs of the Middle East thought it was their turn. They had been living under the Ottoman Empire. The Arabs in Palestine thought they should have a country of their own. So at that point, you get an enormous conflict, and you get a grievance on the side of the Arabs that has lasted ever since. They want a state. They want self-determination of their own. This other people are coming in and want to establish a Jewish state, a state in which they will, will e either be a minority, unable to determine their own destiny, or have to leave. So that's, 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 the, that's the basis. And if you look at that period, you'll understand a lot of the Arab grievance. It goes on, of course. You can go back, you can go up to 1947, when the United Nations decides to partition Palestine. It's about 30% uh, Jewish, 70% Arab. The proposal for partition is 56% Jewish, 40% Arab, and, and the rest 4% uh, under U UN control. After the war, 1948, it's 78-22. After, 19, uh, after 1967, the West Bank and Gaza are occupied. So in, a, in effect, that grievance remains. Now, what about the Zionism? If you, if you look now at that period up to, let's say, 1924, 1925 or so, the kind of justifications for a people settling in Palestine are either biblical. You have to be believe, again, that people who lived someplace in the hundreds and hundreds and even thousands years before have the right to settle there and reestablish their own state, or they're in a, of a kind that, that the Jews are going to bring civilization to a, to a barbarous people. What changes in 1925? What gives Zionism a moral justification that to some extent it really didn't have before? Two things happen. The first thing that happens is that immigration to the West gets cut off. 1924 in the United States, immigration laws. Same things happened uh, in, over the next 10 years uh, th uh, in, in Europe, South America, um, South Africa. In, from 1880 to World War I, when pogroms, when, when, the, um, when, when, the, when the Tsar and the Black Hundreds would come into Jewish settlements and kill people and burn down synagogues, there was tremendous emigration. 2.5 million people left the Pale of Settlement, 2.5 million Jews in that time. 1.2 million came to the United States. 30,000 went to Palestine. So what I'm trying to say is that, that up until 1924, uh, the United States was in effect.